Hello and welcome to the Brigham Young University Family History Library webinar series. My name is Sean Firmage. I will be your host for this webinar. Before we start, we have a couple polls down at the bottom of the screen. If you'd like to participate in those, that would be a great help. Um, also, by way of announcement, our next webinar will be tomorrow at the same time at 3 p.m. Mountain Daylight Time. And that will be um, No More Microfilm Rentals, Where Do I Go to See the Digital Copies? And that will also be by James Tanner. Um, also, during today's presentation, we will have a question pod to the right of the slideshow. If you guys have any questions, um, feel free to type those in, and we will make sure they get answered before the end of today's presentation. Uh, today, we will be pleased to hear from James Tanner, who will be giving a presentation titled, What Makes Vital Records So Vital? James has a bachelor's in Spanish and a master's in linguistics from the University of Utah. He received a Juris Doctor degree in law from Arizona State University. He worked for 39 years as an Arizona trial attorney. He previously owned a retail computer business and Apple Macintosh software company. James has over 35 years of experience in genealogical research and is a blogger for Genealogy Star and the blog Rejoice and Be Exceeding Glad. He served for 10 years as a missionary at the Mesa, Arizona Family Search Library and is currently serving here at the BYU Family History Library. He is the co-author or author of over 25 books on genealogical research and has presented at expos and conferences around the United States and Canada. James has seven children and 33 grandchildren. We'll go ahead and turn the time over to you, James. Howdy, this is James Tanner. Glad to be here on another BYU Family History Library webinar. Today's webinar is called, What Makes Vital Records So Vital? And we are also reminding everyone that these webinars are recorded and are um, uploaded to our BYU Family History Library YouTube channel. So we'd like to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel if you would like to have a notification. It also helps us if you subscribe because we get a little bit higher visibility with uh, YouTube and get to compete with all the dogs and cats and such that are on there. Okay, so this, today we're talking about vital records, and the first thing, question of course, is what are vital records? And the answer here is they are records of events kept under governmental authority, including birth certificates, marriage licenses, and death certificates. And they are one of the mainstay of genealogical research. There's something that uh, most genealogists who are involved with uh, genealogy at all have become very much acquainted with because they are the easiest, I would say the, the best, not maybe perhaps the best, but the easiest records to, uh, to find in many cases about an individual in their life, uh, the beginning of the marriage and the death. Now, many job, but unfortunately many genealogists uh, apparently assume that they are the beginning and the end of research. In other words, uh, I see what's called the big three on most of the lists of sources that people have for their ancestors. Uh, that would be vital records, census records, and cemetery records. And so I, th I see those very frequently, but I very seldom see things beyond that. And uh, although I would encourage people to go beyond that, today we are going to focus on those vital records because there are some very, very uh, uh, limiting problems with what's happened with vital records over the last few years, last hundreds of years. And we need to understand that vital records are a rather recent development. That means, very simply, that um, they have not, they're a recent innovation. The governments have only within the last 200 years or, or less uh, began begun uh, documenting the individual uh, residents of their country's lives. And understand that documenting a person's life can be a challenge. For First of all, uh, it's obvious that today people assume that certificates are, are the easiest way to find uh, the, the uh, events in a doctor, in a, in a person's life. But uh, <clears throat> The truth is that you may never find a birth, marriage, or a death date uh, 
it simply did never got recorded. Uh, people do wander off into the wilderness and, and get lost and, and a death is never recorded. Um, people do uh, live together for many years and have a lot of children and n never get married. And births were not always recorded. It was uh, considered to be of any interest other than to the immediate family and there certainly wasn't any reason for the governments to get involved with recording births. So we have to understand that this is a limitation. Of all of those records that we would consider to be vital records, marriage records are the ones that most directly affect property ownership. And for that reason, they are the ones that are the most likely to have been recorded and preserved. So uh, if we were going to begin looking for records and we wanted to begin with some type of record, we would be looking for marriage records. That would be the first and most obvious choice among uh, genealogical researchers. And they're more common than either birth or death records. So there's no question that if you began working on, uh, on your genealogy and doing research, you're going to have an easier time finding marriage records than you do uh, birth or death records. Now, for any individual, there's an exception for, uh, to any rule like that. And it, it may be possible that the individual never got married, which is a possibility, or that the marriage was, uh, uh, was done in some kind of private ceremony or religious ceremony, and then you are unable to find those records. And so the question is, uh, can we go to the, uh, the governmental records or vital records that, that are the term to find that information? Kind of going back and focusing on marriage records first, the earliest marriage records go clear back to the Elephantine Papyri of approximately 500 BCE. That's before the Common Era or BC. So this is uh, something that marriage records have been uh, recorded for a very, very long time. And um, if I were doing any choices, as I said a moment ago, I would probably choose to look for marriage records before I went to spend any great amount of time trying to find somebody's birth record. And as far as we're concerned in the United States here, U.S. official state recorded marriage records are a recent innovation. The earliest records of official state recorded marriage records that we are aware of go to the to or began in 1811 in the District of Columbia. Now, that's not to say that rec that marriage records were not recorded earlier, but they are in alternative uh, locations. For example. Marriage records in the early uh, years of the uh, colonies, of the British colonies, for example, were probably, if they were recorded, were recorded in, uh, some, in the context of some other type of record, such as a town record or a church record or perhaps a, uh, a land record or some, something else that, uh, that memorialized the uh, marriage, but did not necessarily class, was not necessarily classified as a quote unquote marriage record. And the last state to record marriages, last two states actually, were Washington and Nevada, and they did not start recording marriages as a state law basis until 1968. Okay, so uh, trying to find marriages uh, in some areas of the United States can be uh, can be a little bit frustrating simply because the states did not record them. Now, that did not mean that there weren't uh, individual counties that recorded those marriage records or that marriage records weren't recorded by churches or other institutions. But this is, uh, this is the uh, time frame uh, of looking at states. So whenever you're involved with a particular type of record, it doesn't matter if it's just a vital record or whatever, census records or state tax land or uh, any kind of record that exists, it's a good idea to do a little bit of research before you get started to determine when the earliest records of that type were, were created by whatever entity or jurisdiction that you're uh, working with. And so, for instance, in Arizona, uh, where I used to live, uh, the earliest records, of course, uh, for any place in Arizona probably uh, did not date much before 1500. Um, 
uh, that's because in 1492 Columbus discovered America and that was really the reason why people started keeping records. But uh, it would be surprising to some to know that there are records in Arizona that go back into the 1500s and that's because uh, Arizona was part of the Spanish Empire and was part of Mexico. And so the, there are records very early in, in, uh, uh, in Arizona. But if you move a few, few miles north uh, and go to the next state, then you would find that there were, uh, that the earliest records wouldn't have occurred until 1847. And that was when the European settlers uh, began the process of coming into uh, what we now call the state of Utah. In, uh, in the federal census, the information about marital status was first collected in 1890. Beginning in the 1890s, U.S. federal census records of marital uh, status were recorded. However, the 1890 U.S. federal census was lost because of a fire and uh, governmental neglect. And in, in uh, and subsequent to that, in 1900, 1910, 1920, uh, generally speaking, marital status is included. And one other thing about marital, marital status that's important to understand is most people begin to uh, start to look for records, and I always encourage people to look for records according to the location, the place where the people lived, where events occurred. Uh, Unfortunately, for marriages, uh, that doesn't always work very well. And uh, this is a Gretna Green. A Gretna Green, uh, actually, Gretna Green is a town in Scotland. And what it was, it was a it was a mecca for marriages. Why? Because it was cheap, and because it had accommodated people who were underage. Uh, the the laws in Scotland were different than they were in England and people were able to go there and get marriages quickly. And the name of the town where this occurred, Gretna Green, uh, became a generic term for running away to get married. And uh, in the United States, we have a lot of Gretna Greens. We have Las Vegas, we have Niagara Falls, we have uh, uh, it's different places around the country where people go to, uh, to get married. Uh, it may be in a different state. Uh, uh, all sorts of things. In fact, in Arizona, people would run down to Mexico and get married because Mexican marriage, uh, wedding, uh, marriage requirements were extremely loose. And the answer is you could never find those marriages because they could have been hundreds or even thousands of miles away from where the people actually lived. And so uh, finding those marriage records may require looking in the obvious Gretna Greens from the area where the people went. If they were in uh, in New York, for example, they may have gone up in the mountains a little to the north to the Catskills and gotten married. If they were in uh, uh, New Jersey, they may have gone to Atlantic City. Uh, there's lots of different things and reasons why people would have traveled to a, merit, to a different location. From the standpoint of the man and the woman getting married, uh, the marital couple getting married, uh, we often try to look at the wife's location. It seemed like the wives in the United States had had more uh, input about where the marriage occurred. Uh, that, as you come forward in time, uh, becomes more and more of an issue because uh, people became more mobile and it was possible. And uh, don't forget Hawaii, all the people who fly across to Hawaii to get married. Uh, there's lots of things like that, that that need to be included in your considerations of looking for marriage records. So these are the popular wedding locations, and uh, some were selected simply because of their uh, tourist attraction type uh, of locations, or others because the laws were less stringent. Las Vegas and Nevada in general became a mecca for marriages simply because their requirements for residency and for various requirements such as blood tests and things were, were a lot less stringent than they were in the rest of the United States at the time. I don't think that's so much the case today. Um, so where can these records be found? If, if you're looking for earlier marriage records, 
then uh, and you and you have to look for a record that uh, that occurs before the state or the government was issuing any kind of, of uh, recognition of the wed of the marriage in the form of a certificate or whatever then you should look in church records. Church records are the obvious first choice. Uh, they go back into hundreds of years and marriages have been recorded by uh, the churches uh, in the United States since the very beginning of the United States of America, of people coming to America. And um, in Europe, as far back as records are kept. In, in England, for example, England's records in the parishes among the, the, the Church of England's records began in 1538, and so they're, they go way back. So this is where we can find the records. Um, also look in city and county civil registrations, although the states may not have required the records to be kept. There are many places where they were kept for other reasons, and including the fact that, I meant, as I mentioned at the beginning, that they affect property uh, in the way that the property is owned. Um, that's kind of a different subject, but basically when a wife, uh, when a woman got married in uh, most of the United States through the history and back into the colonies before the United States, she had what was called a dower interest and may, and still in some states does do, they do have a dower interest and the wife's dower interest had to be accounted for in the sale of any property by the marital, uh, by the pair of people who were married. Um, in addition, land and property documents are extremely valuable for finding marriage records. It's often that the wife had to uh, disclaim her dower interest in the property, meaning the uh, right that she had to the property that she acquired uh, and brought into the marriage and uh, in order for the property to be sold. And in lack of her uh, disclaiming or uh, giving up her dower interest, the wife may have maintained that dower interest. Uh, for example, here's an example of the kinds of things that would be, uh, you would find in a mar about marriage records in, uh, in land records. Uh, because a wife maintained this dower interest, if her husband died and uh, someone uh, acquired the property without the permission of the wife, then the wife could come back and reclaim the property out of the uh, probate uh, even many years later uh, because she her right and interest had never been terminated. And so there may be actions even years after uh, a, uh, the husband dies uh, that reveal the wife's dower interest. What's this important is because oftentimes uh, looking at the records uh, of the wife's interest in the property discloses her maiden name and, and even the names of her parents and other information that may be helpful uh, to, uh, to discovering further information about your ancestors. Um, family Bibles and personal histories obviously are uh, records of, of major events and Bible records often uh, record marriages and deaths and births. Um, it's a very common thing. The, the, Difficulty, of course, with Bible records is that they're a single record in a single place, and the Bible itself may be a past, may have been passed down through the family, and the family may still own the have the Bible in their possession, but uh, which of the now maybe thousands of descendants of the original person who owned that Bible is the one who has it? That's that's the problem, and I think that uh, the the uh, number of uh, online family trees and the, the fact that people can put the, that information now online is, uh, is very helpful in helping us to locate family Bibles. There are also many collections of family Bibles in various archives and libraries and, and uh, places around the, the United States that actually uh, Bible collections on FamilySearch.org and on Ancestry and some of the other, other large um, online websites. Newspapers often list articles about marriage. They, they uh, have marriage announcements. They have uh, announcements about uh, uh, receptions or marriage parties and they may even include lists of all the people who attended and uh, who were involved and could be a very very good source. And newspapers go back uh, into uh, the uh, 1600s in the United States. 
and uh, Europe. So it, they're a very good source for information about uh, the marriages. Obituaries sometimes give marriage information, uh, tell who the wife was or who the husband was. Um, not always, unfortunately, but uh, it can happen. And uh, in some cases, if there were multiple marriages, it may be uh, evident or uh, explained a little bit in the, uh, in the obituary. So that's another way that we can find that information. And ultimately, state archives, uh, where all these records went. Uh, it's, uh, it's interesting, if you think about it long enough, you'll figure out that uh, some kinds of records that you may not think of primarily as marriage records could be a very a uh, good source for rec for marriage information. For example, and I don't list it here, school records. Uh, if you have a school record, it may tell who the parents are. And if it tells who the parents are, you may have the names of, a, of the parents and the fact that they were married. OK, now we're going to change to birth certificates, because we're going to talk about marriage, births, and deaths here, and, this, uh, and uh, divorces and a few other things that uh, get thrown into this category. Uh, my first and common uh, response here about birth certificates is do not expect to find early birth certificates. Uh, I have people come in all the time and saying, oh, I just am looking for a birth record for my great-grandmother. And, and I say, well, when was she born? And they say uh, sometime um, in the 1880s or 1870s, and I say, uh, when did she get married? And they say early uh, 1900. And I say, well, uh, this would be in Arizona. And I say, well, you need to understand that perhaps that uh, birth records weren't recorded in Arizona until 1906. And they weren't uniformly recorded throughout the state until 1920. So the fact that she was born back in the 1800s, uh, there's possibility there was a birth record, but that's not very likely. And uh, most people are kind of surprised to find that that's the case. But this is the earliest state to record births. And that's as a state. And that is in 1841. So Massachusetts was the earliest in 1841. The last one to record births was New Mexico. And that was 1920. So sometime between 1841 and 1920, depending on which state uh, your people were supposedly born in, uh, you may or may not find uh, a birth certificate. And usually records of births were um, uh, the earlier you go into that time frame, closer to the, to the first time that the records were ordered to be or required to be recorded, what would happen is that you got very spotty uh, compliance with any requirement like that. So uh, it's not unusual that you would miss a significant number of people until uh, the time when it was uh, basically mandated uniformly across states and, and people began came used to the idea of reporting births. So where would you find the birth record if you can't find a birth certificate? And the answer, again, is church records, which often provide records. Now, birth records, for example, in church records are uh, get a little bit confusing. Most of the churches who record births actually do not record the birth. They record the baptism or christening of the infant, not the birth date. Um, there's you know, a lot of records about when the babies were brought to the church to get christened, but there are very few of the churches that maintained uh, consistent birth records. Uh, there's are, there are a few exceptions, but not too many. So what we get is a christening record. And if you are aware of the current status of, of genealogical software in the United States, you know that uh, uh, there is a common du dual place for putting uh, early birth information. Uh, usually, there's a place to record the birth. And then there's a place called a christening uh, to record the christening. Well, the christening here is the uh, infant baptism of the, of the child and the date that that was re actually recorded. And so that's what goes into the christening date. Uh, cemetery records uh, uh, very frequently record the birth. Um, unfortunately, they're not absolutely reliable because uh, they are uh, recorded at a rather distant time from the uh, 
uh, original occurrence, the birth. Um, obviously, the, the younger a person dies, the more, more accurate the record's going to be uh, when people start getting into their 60s and 70s and 80s and on, on up. Uh, sometimes uh, the information about their exact birth date becomes a little fuzzy. But uh, so this is a, there's still a place where you can go to get the record. Uh, state and federal census records are um, uh, basically unreliable, uh, almost always off at least a year. Uh, why is that? Well, the census was taken as of a certain date. Uh, so for example, if the, if the date of the census was June 1st of the, given, of the census year, say 1910, then anyone born before June 1st would have already had a birthday. Anybody born after June 1st would still be the age they were for the preceding year. And so those kinds of, of issues uh, basically throw off census records by at least one year from the time that a person was actually born. Um, you can put it in as an approximate date, but always re remember that if the information about a birth date came from a census, uh, it was assumed that the person was telling the truth. And uh, we, uh, as genealogists, find out that that is not always the case. Uh, it is also a possibility that the people lied about their age. Oh, and by the way, looking back for a moment, uh, the information about births in marriage records can also be uh, really unreliable, particularly if it looks like the couple got married when they were in their 18 to 19 to 20 to 21 year age. If the state required people to be 21 years of age or older, um, it is not unusual and I have found on uh, uh, more than just a few uh, cases where either the husband or the wife uh, did not reveal their correct age to the, the person who was allowing the, the marriage to go forward. On the other hand, uh, th the reason for that was obvious. If, the, if it was a man who was getting married and he was under age, he would have had to have required, most of the states required that his parents give consent. If, if the parents were against the marriage or the uh, parents were not consulted about the marriage, then uh, those kinds of situations would, uh, would mandate uh, a uh, representation of age that was contrary to the truth. Um, another another possibility out there is that people just simply lied about their age. Uh, uh, I have uh, uh, records where um, we knew for we knew the mar we knew the birth dates of the individuals, but in these two cases, these two women got married, and uh, both of them lied about ten years off of what their actual age was. So, and it wasn't up. It was down, obviously. So, this is this is the problem. Newspapers, uh, birth records. Um, it wasn't too many years ago that um, that newspapers uh, published uh, lists of all the births that occurred uh, in the hospitals, local hospitals, or the local in the local towns. And so, they are a very good uh, source of records. The newspapers uh, are generally becoming more and more available online. There are uh, literally hundreds of, of online digital newspaper sites, and there are some very, very large ones uh, that you can find online. Um, I will be giving another webinar later uh, that will be posted a little later this month on newspapers, so uh, we'll get to that when we talk about the newspapers. Uh, military records are also good for birth, and now once again we have a problem because there are some of the men who are signing up for military service who uh, uh, were lying about their age. They were 14, 15, and 16, and 17 instead of the mandatory age of 18, and uh, looked a little older than they actually were, and were able to uh, pass for being older and uh, get into the army or navy or or whatever. Um, but not quite as easy to, as it was the, uh, to as it is to uh, back in the time of the Revolutionary and Civil War and other wars back in those. Uh, 17 and 1800s as it would be today. Uh, today it would be almost impossible or very difficult because you would have to provide a certified um, birth certificate to the army and they could easily check your marriage, your birth date online probably. Probate records. 
Once again, probate records are distant from the time of the birth and, uh, and not nearly as reliable as a birth record that was created uh, at or near the time of the birth, but they are still possible that, that birth records can be uh, created from, uh, can be helpful in, in uh, determining a birth date local and state histories. Uh, sometimes your people may have gotten into the local history uh, and uh, the, uh, their birth date, if they were interviewed by someone for a book or for a newspaper article or magazine article, they may have uh, recorded their birth or uh, their birth date. It's not impossible. It happens and there's lots of newspapers out there. Okay, so now here we are with the next category and that's death certificates. And uh, the question here is, uh, don't expect to find early death certificates. Um, it's the same as marriage and um, births, obviously. And the time frames here is, once again, Massachusetts was the earliest to begin to record death certificates back in 1841. And the last state to record deaths was surprising Vermont in 1955. Okay, so we've got along uh, over 100 and 10 years of spread there of uh, you can make, take your choice from which state. Uh, so it's very important to check this before you start uh, uh, focusing on and sometimes fixating on the fact that you can't find a birth or death or marriage record. Uh, it's very helpful to know the time periods involved here. Alternative death records. Uh, let's go into the categories. Church records. Uh, uh, churches uh, have a tendency to record deaths because that means that their people no longer a member of their church in a sense and so they uh, basically uh, have a, a, some kind of death record. Uh, churches in the United States are um, very uh, known for maintaining cemeteries and so cemetery records are also uh, something that you'll, uh, where you can find the death records. Uh, cemetery records, by the way, are extremely compl complex records in the United States. Um, depending on the time period, they tend to get a, a little more simplified or even absent uh, going into the past. But uh, once you get into the uh, late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, you, you, there really are a whole number of different kinds of cemetery records uh, that uh, become available. Uh, and are uh, possibly have, could have possibly been maintained by the cemetery or the or the sponsoring institution of the cemetery. State and federal census records. In fact, the United States and part of the census uh, has what are called mortality schedules. These were published during certain census years, and uh, you may want to check the mortality schedules for the names of the people who died in the preceding year uh, to the for the taking of the census. And newspapers are also a, uh, a good source of information. Obituaries, uh, we get a lot of digitized newspapers out there, as I mentioned previously, and uh, they include the, the obituaries. I, I, I get this question uh, quite frequently. I talk about digitized newspapers, that they've digitized the newspapers, and people say to me, um, well, do that, does that include the obituaries? And I say, well, no, actually, yeah, they just cut them all out before they digitize them. I say, no, of course it includes the, the obituaries. So if you're looking for obituaries, you're really looking for newspapers, folks, because that's where they appear. And so there's the, uh, there's the key to finding those records. Uh, military records, obviously uh, death records uh, are part of the military, uh, the whole of military problem out there that you've got uh, people fighting in wars and getting killed and uh, the military as far as possible generally keeps those records and uh, as well as other, uh, sometimes the dependents, meaning the people who are related to the military person. Probate records are another uh, category of records that uh, contain death records. They're closer to the, the event. Uh, sometimes the only thing you have, you have no death record, only you have a probate record. So the probate record in the court system may be the only notification or indication you have that the of, the, of the time that the person died. Um, unfortunately, probates do not occur necessarily near or at the time of the death and so they may be 
even months or weeks or months or even years after the death before it's actually, the estate is actually probated. probated. Local and state histories again. Now, guess what? Uh, perhaps you've noticed something. It's the same list. Uh, all three of the <laughs> all three of the different types of vital records. It's exactly the same list. So every place that you can find birth records, you can probably find a death record uh, uh, or similar type of record. And every time you find a, a, a marriage record. Uh, may be associated, may be also kept in the same time period as, as birth and death records. So uh, most of these most of these records uh, carry um, have multiple messages. They they bring you different information. Now, why are marriage records different? They are different since marriage records affect property. They're more formal and usually recorded in some way. Uh, a birth record doesn't really affect property only very, very indirectly at the time uh, as far as creating an heir to uh, um, a particular individual, a parent. But marriage records immediately affect property because when a wife marries a husband um, in, in any, any jurisdiction in, in America since the arrival of the pilgrims and in England and every place else, that, that marriage created new property relationships between the spouses and changed their inheritances and uh, the, uh, the rights that people had towards property. Now, the, the wife, uh, women, uh, were uh, during early, early years had fewer rights uh, than the men did, and uh, those rights were affected more dramatically by marriage than any, uh, than any other event. Um, for example, if uh, in most states, uh, up to and including the present, um, but not uh, necessarily in the United States, the, if the wife marries a husband, and the husband immediately becomes the owner of all of the wife's personal property. And that was the law in the United States and back into the colonies for many, many years. Uh, it's not necessarily the case, and in some places we have some very surprising marriage laws. Like we have a set of 12 states that are called community property states. Arizona is one of them. And in a community property state, when a person becomes married, then both of the marital partners, as they're called, uh, the, uh, uh, receive 50% interest in all of the property, an undivided 50% interest in all of the property that is owned by the marital partnership or the marital community as it's called and the marital community uh, it, any property which is acquired during coverture is the term that's used and the coverture means that uh, it was during the time of the existence of the marriage is uh, is automatically the owned by each of the part marital community partners uh, in by 50 a 50% undivided interest. So <clears throat> it gets a little complicated, uh, but uh, in other states, the, the percentage of the wife's ownership is different, uh, and the circumstances are different. And it may be an, a, a very interesting, if not only interesting, but uh, important to doing research to understand at least the basics of the uh, of property law and of what happens during at the time of marriage. Uh, it's also helpful if you're going to planning on getting married, by the way, to understand a little bit about what happens to the law of the property when they when you're in that position. Marriage records can be found in property transfers uh, in the form of a disclaimer deed. And a disclaimer deed is a deed that says that the wife has no um, uh, right or ownership in the property uh, or disclaims her any ownership right she has to the property, and it's. Uh, necessary in order to, for the husband to transfer the full title uh, interest in the property. Now, uh, what about a community property state? Well, in a community property state, uh, basically you cannot sell a piece of property unless both the spouses sign off on the property. It's just a simple rule down there in uh, those community property states. And if, if it turns out that a piece of property was uh, sold in Arizona, without a, a specific reference to whether or not the person transferring the property was married, uh, 
then there is a defect or cloud on the title of the property and that has to be cleaned up or determined before the property can be resold. So um, there are some interesting things and they all help genealogists because they help us to understand and recognize uh, the property ownership and that, that identifies the marriage relationship. And here we are, divorce records are usually include information about the marriage. So if you find the divorce, you probably find information about the marriage. Also, there's child custody matters. You may find that in the court uh, where the, uh, the, the marital uh, people are, the, uh, the, the spouses are arguing about who has custody over the, the minor children. And there can be other legal actions. <clears throat> and in any legal action, it's very common throughout the United States to um, name both of the, of the parties both the husband and the wife. So if you can uh, find out uh, whether or not there's a lawsuit, you may very well identify the wife. And it's, and it's even possible you may identify the wife's maiden name as a, if, if it's uh, pertinent to the lawsuit. Now, uh, I th this brings us up to a pretty common rule that I like to mention from time to time. And that is that uh, when really bad things happen to your ancestors, it's really good news for all the genealogists because the worst thing that can happen are all things that create records and create events in their lives that help us to find out who they are. And by the way, about divorce, in 1858, England, in 1858 in England, there were only a total of 24 divorces in the entire country. Okay, so if you're wondering what happened to the wife or the husband in English and you, in England and you begin to think immediately that there might have been a divorce, the answer is don't think there might have been a divorce in England because it probably was so rare the chances of there being a divorce are almost zero. And so it wasn't until 1897 that there were never more than 500 divorces a year in the entire country of England. So clear up until, eight, until almost 1900, the total number of divorces in any one year was less than 500 out of the entire country. There are millions of people in, in England by 1900. And the number of divorces in England did not begin to rise until after World War II. So uh, if you're looking back in the old days and, and the husband disappears or the wife disappears, they either died or they, dis they walked away. Don't expect to find a divorce except in very, very rare cases and usually only involving, involving people with substantial property. And by the way, divorces in the United States show a similar trend. Divorces were extremely unusual in the early history of the United States and they only became more common after World War II. Okay, so what about church and town records? Well, we have an interesting situation there. Um, the church records, uh, as I mentioned earlier, English parish registers, which are the uh, small geographic areas uh, part of the different churches. Uh, even the churches who uh, broke away, the Catholic Church has parishes, and uh, then it has larger uh, geographic um, organizations uh, that that are made up of uh, several parishes and they're called dioceses. Well, that same organization, even though there was a difference in, in uh, doctrine between the Protestants and the Catholics, the Protestants by and large um, began the pro uh, adopted the same uh, type of organization. So the Church of England or the, and the Episcopal Church here in the United States uh, still have parishes and still have dioceses and the Catholic Church does also. Uh, as, the, as people came to the United States uh, with different religious persuasions and as different religions arose here in, in the United States, then there was a more sort of town um, uh, council, sort of uh, geographically associated re, uh, organizations of, of the churches. And uh, they were more organized around the congregation rather than they were around uh, any particular geographic area. So you really have to know a little bit about the, the history of the church of your, of your ancestors. And uh, town records, by the way, began with the very first settlements uh, 
the earliest records we have in uh, Massachusetts are from uh, 1620 with uh, the Plymouth uh, se settlers who, who settled in the Plymouth Plantation. Uh, and down in Virginia, we have uh, the uh, Jamestown, and those are the earliest settlements, and the town records are pretty uh, consistently available in some form or another from that time period. Um, not all of them have been preserved, but uh, they are a extremely valuable source of day-to-day -day information about uh, the towns where your ancestors may have lived here. And Spanish records, by the way, uh, began with the conquest of Mexico clear back in the 1500s. And so most parts of the western part of the United States, southwestern part, for example, from Texas on over into California, uh, and up into uh, even into places like Kansas and other places. Um, there are records going back into, uh, depending on the distance from the border and how far north, uh, beginning into the early 1500s down in Mexico and Central and South America. So in England, in America, the English records began with the colonists. So it was 1607 with Jamestown and 1620 with Plymouth. Um, you know there were there were earlier there there were earlier settlements. The Spanish were here before. Uh, there were some that were right after from the Dutch and from other countries. I learned recently that there was a brief Swedish colony in the United States, which I had not been aware of. Uh, and so there was all sorts of, uh, of, of different types of times of time frames when those records might have been available. Now, one of the questions that comes up about births, deaths, and marriages particularly is can you as a genealogist calculate those dates? What if it says that the person was 60 years old in the, in the 1910 census? So then can you go back 60 years and, and use that as his, as his or her birth date? And the answer, of course, is yes, you can. And there are some very kind of general rules of practice that we, are, uh, that we use. Um, and are fairly well uh, accepted. Now, don't mistake a calculated date from for a uh, an actual record date. Uh, so, if you've calculated a date, it's a good way to make an, a good a good idea to make a note of the fact that the date that you've supplied is calculated and not coming from a particular record. Um, some people actually write it in the date. However, to, in today's world with computers and the way the computers work, unless the specific computer program that you're um, using allows you to mark the date as calculated or whatever, it's not a good idea to throw in seeing, uh, you know, um, abbreviations like CAL 1890, meaning calculated back to 1890. So we'll kind of uh, we kind of don't do that very much anymore. Uh, so you can calculate the date of death from a census or from a christening record. Um, it's dangerous to do that from a christening record because um, christening was a baptism into the church and it was something that many people did not do immediately upon the, the birth of the infant. Uh, in fact, uh, it's not unusual for me in doing some types of records, uh, mostly Catholic records, to find where a couple were coming to get married and the priest refused to marry them because they hadn't been baptized. And so they had to go get baptized before the church would marry them. And they might have been, you know, in their 18, 19, 20, 25 year old people or even older. Uh, and it's also possible that people did not get baptized, so christening records may not always be available. Marriage dates uh, can be estimated for one year before the birth of the first child, and subsequent children are estimated at two-year intervals. Obviously, that doesn't work if there's uh, stillborn or miscarriages or any of the other problems that people have, but uh, subsequent children, uh, as a genealogist, if we see more than a two-year gap in the, in a, between two children, we automatically assume that there may be a missing child. Uh, we don't always find the missing child, but that that is a valid assumption. It's something that needs to be done. The average age for marriage is estimated to be 25 for men and 21 for women, but you need to take account uh, local variations and the fact that the further you go back in time, uh, 
it's more likely that the women could have been and were married at a much younger age. Um, and it also depends on the country. Uh, in uh, Scandinavia, these would be perfectly good, good estimates. In England, in the early 1700s, uh, you probably would not have seen too many women uh, unmarried at the age of 21. Um, so one of the important points that you should glean from this is that uh, you become aware of the earliest date for all types of records. Uh, just know approximately or give a ballpark of the time period when you can no longer look for records of a certain type. Uh, and that is very important. For example, the first US census was, was taken in 1790. The first British census was taken uh, in 1841, but there were early one in 1800, but they, didn't, uh, they weren't uh, detailed enough to give information about the individuals. So uh, knowing that kind of information, that kind of ballpark information is very, helpful in uh, evaluating whether or not you're going to find uh, a particular record. So keep looking, but don't get hung up looking for one record. I, I find too many people who have fixated on finding a birth record or a marriage record or a death record and say, oh, I just, I've been looking for years for a marriage record for my grandparents. Well, maybe they never got married. Let's get, to, you know, get on with that, looking for other things if that record turns up. Um, one of the rules, by the way, the basic rules, uh, you, you know, I, I'm good at this. The first one, uh, basic rule of, of life is, uh, of genealogical rule is um, uh, when the baby was born, the mother was there. But that's, the, that's the basic rule. But there's also a rule that says uh, absence of a death record does not indicate that the person is still alive. Um, and if you think about that for a moment, that's uh, probably the case. So uh, don't get hung up looking at that. And thanks for watching. Uh, we're here again with uh, this is a BYU Family History Library webinar and will be posted to the BYU Family History Library YouTube channel. So look for it. And we would invite you to subscribe. Uh, by the way, this photo. Oh, we have a question. We'll get to it. Uh, we have a question, but we'll get to this. Uh, we have a, a photo here. And I usually just have one of my random photos that I put up. Uh, actually, all these photos were taken by me. This happens to be the Oregon Trail, uh, a portion of the Oregon Trail in Oregon. Okay, so there, there we uh, can see what those early Oregon people had to. They had some promise that at the end of this dusty bunch of sagebrush, there was actually going to be some farmland or something that they could live on. So anyway, it was a nice, very hot, and very smoky day when we were standing there on the Oregon Trail. Question. Okay. okay, there's a question that says, is there a site to find out when each state started keeping records? Is there a place they could look to find that information? Yeah, generally speaking, the easiest way to do that is to um, uh, look at the familysearch.org research wiki. Uh, for each of the states and counties and jurisdictions and all the different jurisdictions, the wiki, if, if it does anything, it tells when the earliest records of each category are available in those jurisdictions. And that's really the fastest and easiest way. In England, there is a, uh, a publication called the Philimore, that's P-H-I-L-L-I-M-O-R-E Atlas, the Philimore Atlas, and it's on Ancestry. And it tells the earliest, updated earliest records that are available for each parish in the entire country. So there are some places, there are places to look. And um, actually, the simplest thing, and what I do is I just type into Google and say, uh, earliest marriage records in Clinton County, New Jersey, or something, and bank, it tells me, comes up with, usually comes up with a wiki. Any other questions out there in the world? It looks like that might be the only one. All right. Well, I think we'll wrap it up. Thank you, James, for that awesome presentation. Uh, we'll make sure to upload this to YouTube today. Uh, if you guys would like to, to share it or rewatch it, um, it will be up on our, our YouTube channel. And uh, like James was saying, it, it would be a great help for you to subscribe to that channel as well so you get notifications for every, every video that we do post. Um,
And just one final reminder, our next webinar is tomorrow, also at 3 p.m. Mountain Daylight Time. That will be with James as well. All right, thank you very much.